soul cries out, my soul cries out for you. These balls cry out, these dry balls cry for you to live and move. Cause only you can raise the dead, can lift my head up. Jesus, show me. Howdy, church. Everybody good today on all of our campuses? Everybody happy to be at church today? Man, I am. Got an extra hour of sleep last night. Man, that was awesome. And uh, Alabama LSU, the game of the century, right? That was the game of the century. I want my 100 years back. I saw a guy wrote that. Good gosh, it was boring. Anyway, um, but obviously we have an LSU fan at the Anderson campus that was really excited about that. So praise God for LSU. Okay, never mind. Um, if you have a Bible today, I want you to grab them on all of our campuses and go to Job 1 and Job 42. Job 1 and Job 42 is where we're going to go today. I'm really excited because up until a couple months ago, when I, or actually back in the late spring, when I was going through Job in my quiet time, I had never seen what I'm about to show you in the book of Job. And it is, it is so cool, um, but it's a little uncomfortable. And all of us have probably been in an uncomfortable situation or two in our life. I was thinking about, uh, since I've been pastoring New Spring, in fact, since I've been in the ministry, I've been in quite a few uncomfortable situations. I was recalling a time where Lucretia, my wife, and I were invited over to a couple's house, and this couple attended our church, and this was B.C. in our life before Karis. That's my four-year-old. And so we, we um, remember what it was like to be able to do things on the fly before, before you had kids? Like you could just do stuff, and now you got a plan? So they were like, hey, you want to come over for dinner? We're like, sure. And um, she was a great cook, and, and that matters, by the way. And so, so we went to their house, and we're kind of eating dinner. And one of the things I love to do is if I'm talking to a couple, I want to know your story. Like, I want to know how you met. I want to know where you met. Um, I always want to know where you went on your honeymoon. Uh, I just like to know that. I mean, I just, I, what'd you do? I know what you did on your honeymoon. I just, I just like to know those things. So anyway, I don't ask that, by the way. And so um, we were having this great conversation. And it was the, the husband and the wife and the two kids were kind of sitting around the table having fun. And, and uh, I said, so how long have you guys been married? And they were like, 10 years. And it was a great conversation. And then the son um, raised his hand and said, Dad, 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 I'm 11. <laughs> That's how I felt right there. But I was there. See, I'm just telling you, I was there. And I, like, have you ever wanted Jesus to come back at, like, right? Because I did not know what to do. I was like, <clears throat> um, am I going to eat that biscuit? Like, I, 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 didn't, I, I, was, I was highly uncomfortable. By the way, the dad, the dad handled it beautifully. Like, he um, explained it. I mean, just kind of, I mean, it was awesome. But I never, I never will forget being uncomfortable. I, and and it, I thought about church. I remember, and I'll talk more about this next week. I'm really excited about next week. But when I first started going to church, there were days that I just really loved being in church, and there were days that I was like, man, this thing needs to be over. I'm just highly uncomfortable. Now, I'm saying all this to say this. Today is going to be uncomfortable. Highly uncomfortable. Because I'm going to talk about money. And I just want to be honest with you. The last service... Um, the early services today, I kind of felt like I was out here preaching with no clothes on, which would be weird. Um, but I, I, it, it felt really, really, really awkward to me. I, I'm going to talk about money today. And it's going to be highly uncomfortable. Everybody in here has thought about money this week. Who's, who has thought about money this week? Okay, if you didn't raise your hand, you're a liar. We've seen newspaper articles on it. Um, we've seen the Occupy Wall Street protesters. By the way, I'm going to New York today. I'm really excited about that. I might run down there and talk to them. I'm not going to do that. Anyway, uh, I, we, we've seen that. Um, money is a tense, tense, 
tense subject. And then we come to church, and the pastor's going to talk about money. Now, let me say this. I'm willing to risk today being misunderstood so that you can have financial freedom. Because I want you to listen to me. I don't care who you are, and I don't care how much money you have. I'm not after your money. I don't care how much money you have. Like, like I, I, don't, I don't care how much money you have. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, you can keep your money. I want for you to give your life to Jesus. That's why we do what we do. That's why we do church in every location. It's so people will give their lives to Jesus. And by the way, in the earlier services today, when I preached on tithing, people gave their lives to Jesus. I, I'm preaching on money today because, number one, there are people in this room that are in financial bondage. And when, when you receive Jesus into your life, he wants you to be free in every single area of your life. I do not have a prayer cloth to sell you today. My wife does not have pink hair, and we will not be purchasing gold thrones for the stage anytime soon. I'm going to preach on money today. And listen to me. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to preach hard. You know why? Because I want for you to experience freedom in your life like you never have before. I want you to experience the same freedom that I've experienced in my life. So I want you to stay with me. It's going to be tense. It's going to be silent today. I haven't got a lot of amens today. Until the last service, you could hear a rat fart up in here. I mean, it, like, it's, 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 I'm not sure if they do or not. But if, if they did, you would hear it. And you'd hear that. So I, just, I don't even know. But I'm t we're talking about the life of Job, the story of hope. And here's what I know about the book of Job. The, jo the book of Job is a story about hope. And here's what I know about God. God wants for us to be blessed. And God wants for us to be blessed in every area of our life. We've talked about so far in order to live a blessed life that, number one, we do not give up on the God that has not given up on us. Last week, we talked about to stop making excuses and start making a difference. And by the way, if you're brand new to New Spring Church, if you want to listen to any one of those messages or watch any of those messages, you can go to newspring.cc, which is our website, or you can download the messages for free on iTunes and you can catch up. Today, um, week three, I just want to start reading in Job 1 because I believe with all my heart, and I believe this with all my heart, I believe that God wants for you, if you're his child, to be financially blessed. Now, I know some people don't believe that. In fact, and and you, may, you may be hearing going, well, if God wants me blessed, he sure does not get what he wants because I am not blessed, which I would actually argue you're more blessed than you think you are, and we'll get to that later. But I want to show you something in the book of Job. And listen, the only reason I'm bringing it up today is because it's in the Bible. Let me just say this. Another reason I'm teaching on this today is because in 20 years of ministry, I can tell you that money is the number one competitor for your heart. Jesus said that in Matthew 6, 24. He said, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Jesus said that money is the number one competitor for our hearts. So today, the reason it gets tense in the room is because I'm going to take your God and smack him in the face. That, that's where the tension comes from. I believe with all my heart that God wants for you to be blessed financially. And let me just read this to you because this is so cool. I saw this in the book of Job. This is awesome. Job chapter 1, verse 1. In the land of us, anybody from us? Okay, cool. In, in the land of us, there was a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He, look at this, feared God. He feared God. In other words, he had an enormous view of God. His view of God was greater than anything he had. It, he, he feared God. And it, we can't follow him until we fear him. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. That's ten kids. Now, in this society, if you had ten kids, you, you were considered blessed. Some of us might call that cursed, but that, in this society, that was blessed. Can you imagine ten kids going to Walmart? It's freak out. Anyway, so anyway, verse 3. Now, stay with me. I'm going to ask for a little help here. And he owned 7,000 sheep. Now, now, how many sheep did he have? All campuses? 7,000, right, 7,000. Now, I, I'm just going to guess that's a lot of sheep. I can't imagine 7,000 sheep. But to own that many sheep in this society, you were considered blessed. You were considered rich. It was like they didn't have like dollars and cents. They had sheep and goats or what? I'll give you 15 sheep for that or whatever. That sheep, it's a lot of sheep, okay? Stay with me. Um, he had uh, 3,000 sheep, three thousand camels. Now, how many camels did he have? 
3,000 camels, right. Now, in the Middle East, they still barter with camels. I, I had a friend that was on a mission trip over there one time, and she was, uh, she's a blonde-headed, very attractive young lady, and um, she was getting on the bus, and somebody told the guy that was with her, I would give you 3,000 camels for the woman. She said, what do you think about that? I said, I'd have got five. Anyway, so I, so I didn't say that, but they still, so 3,000 camels. Now, that's rich. That's a lot of camels. I, nobody here probably has 3,000 camels. And some probably smoked 3,000 camels. Anyway, so that's the difference. <laughs> this is New Spring. 500 yoke of oxen. Now, how many yoke of oxen did he have? 500. Okay, good, 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 good. Uh, and last of all, and 500 donkeys. How many donkeys did he have? 500. So, in, so far, we've seen he's got, he's got um, 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 donkeys and a large number of servants, and he was the greatest man among all the people of the East. Now, if you'll flip over to Job chapter 42, I want to show you something really significant in the Bible. We just read in Job chapter 1 about all his material possessions. Now, in Later on in Job 1, like all hell broke loose in Job 2 and this, all this crazy stuff that goes on. We'll be talking about that over the next several weeks. But in Job 42, in fact, the, the verse that we've been using for this series to kind of propel the idea is Job 42, 12. The Bible says this, the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. Now, let me ask you this question before we continue reading. Did that blessing that God brought into Job's life include financial blessing? Yes or no? Yes, and we're, we actually get to read about that. Look at this. He had, middle part of verse, verse 12, he had 14,000 sheep. Whoa, whoa, whoa. How many did he have in verse, chapter 1? 7,000, so 7 to 14. Is that blessed? Mm-hmm, that's blessed. Do you go from $7,000 to $14,000? Is that blessed? Yeah, okay. So if you put it in dollars, so none, I don't, I'm not sure 14,000 sheep would be blessing. All right, here we go. 6,000 camels. Whoa, 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 whoa. How many camels did he have in chapter 1? 3,000. So we went from 3,000 to 6,000. I'm just coincidence, I'm sure. Let's just keep reading. 1,000 yoke of oxen. Whoa, 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 whoa. How many oxen did he have in chapter 1? 500. So he goes from 500 to 1,000 here. It's crazy. And 1,000 donkeys. So he had how many donkeys in chapter 1? And then now he has 1,000. And also had seven sons and three daughters. Now, some of you would say, ah, he had 10 kids and he had 10 kids. Is 20 kids a blessing? Come on now. Is from 10 to 20 a blessing? Come on. Ten. Anyway, so, so God blessed him financially. God blessed Job financially. I believe today that God really does want to bless some people in the house financially. I believe, I believe that with all my heart. I believe that with all my heart. The question we've got to ask, though, is why did God bless Job? And that answer is actually found in the Bible. Let me just kind of read you through this. Um, Job chapter 1, verse 4, if you'll flip back over to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1, I think we see about two or three keys in the book of Job as to why, why Job was blessed by God. The first one is in Job chapter 1, verse 4. His sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes. And they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. Look at this. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice. He would, in other words, Job was a giver. Job was a giver. Job gave. Sacrifice means that we sacrifice something, that we give. And look how Job gave. He didn't give. He, he gave generously. He would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them. Thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. So first of all, we see that Job was a giver. Um, later on, and we're going to see this in about three or four weeks, in chapter 38, Job had an even more enormous view of God than he did in, in, in chapter 1. And by the way, having a huge view of God is essential to being a great giver. But number three, I think we see this. Job understood something about everything that we own. Job understood something. Job understood something about this life that, that we many times, especially here in America, fail to see. And we see this in chapter 1, verse 20. After Job lost everything, we talked about this a few weeks ago, after he lost all of his material possessions, after he found out all his children had died, had been killed in the natural disaster, he said this at Job chapter 1, verse 20. At this, Job got up and tore his robe, shaved his head, then he fell to the ground in worship. 
and said, now listen, truer words have never been spoken. Naked I came from my mother's womb. In other words, I came here naked. Everybody here showed up naked. Everybody. Everybody here showed up with nothing. And look at this. And naked I will depart. Now some of you are like, well, I'm not going to depart naked. No, yeah, they will paint you up like a clown, put weird clothes on you. People will come by and say weird things about you. He looks so natural. And then, but you're gone. Hearses do not pull U-Hauls, right? Like you're gone when you're gone. Job said, naked, I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. I want you to write this down because this is the third key to being blessed. Number one is don't give up. Number two, stop making excuses. Number three, understand this concept. I have stewardship. God has ownership. Job understood this. I have stewardship. Everything I have is God's. But God actually owns it. And guess what? Guess what? Don't miss this. The owner always gets to tell the steward what to do. The steward never gets to tell the owner, this is what I think you ought to do with your money. The owner always tells the steward what to do. God has ownership. We have stewardship. Everything, listen to me, everything, quote, we own is on loan. Everything. Everything we own is on loan. We take nothing with us when we die. We have stewardship, but God has ownership. Now today, um, I'm going to share several passages of Scripture with you, and we're going to dive into three concepts. In fact, I'm going to share with you three financial decisions that changed the trajectory of my life. And I know the temptation when anybody talks about money is you got one foot on the brake at this mega church, and they just, you know, they're needing to raise money. Listen, we don't need to raise money. We've been blessed. During the recession this started in 2007, 2008. You know the giving in this church has actually increased every year? Do you know this church actually has to have an annual budget every year, where they are an annual audit every year, where they come in and go over the receipts with a fine-tooth comb, and we pass with flying colors every single year? This church is not in financial trouble, so listen, let's not make it about us, let's make it about you. I want to share with you three financial decisions that I made. And listen, at the end of the day, if anybody gets mad, I'm sure it will. It always happens, usually when it hits the Internet, not at our church, but people that watch on the Internet. For some reason, I guess because they're watching on the Internet. Uh, it's not, that's not everybody on the Internet. I'm talking about when it goes up Tuesday, not live. All you people that are watching live, you obviously love Jesus. But anyway, <laughs> people want to argue. Listen, at the end of the day, I'm just telling you my story. I'm about to share with you how my life and the scriptures collided, and I found out, you know what? The Bible's true. And I decided years ago, listen to me, I want you to listen to me. I'm not going to be one of those Christians that believe the verses about salvation, but refuse to believe the verses about giving. Because I want you to listen to me. If God's not telling the truth with the giving verses, then how in the world can you trust him with the salvation ones? I'm just not going to be that guy. Like if I'm in, I'm all in. If I'm going to follow Jesus, I'm going to try my best to follow Jesus. Now, people have said, well, Perry, you're the pastor of a large church. And, you know, of course, I mean, you're, let, listen, let's not talk about where I am right now. Let me, let, let me just give you a brief history of where I come from. Because there's broke, and then there's broke with a capital B. That's where I was when I met Christ. And um, 1979, 1980, both of my parents worked. I, I was a latchkey kid. Any, I don't know if you were a latchkey kid. I was a latchkey kid. We are the generation that we came home and the parents thought we were doing our homework. We were watching different strokes and happy days. Um, I, was I was that guy. My mom worked um, at a place in Pickens called Singer. I think they're Ryobi now. And my dad was the plant manager at a place in Pickens until he was injured on the job. He had a, he had a head injury, received 45% brain damage, 15% neck damage, 15% back damage. It nearly killed him. He had a blood clot on his brain and nearly died. Had to go surgery. It was crazy. And uh, because of that, he couldn't hold down a job really that well. Um, my mother died in 1982, November 17th, 1982. And it was now looking back, I, I, I see that my mother was the financial stability of our home. She's the one that kept it all together because my father... Um, that was in November of 1982. In December of 1982, he got a settlement from the accident. That, and listen, in 1982, he received thir a check for $35,000. Now, that's like $2 million today or something. I don't even know. That's a lot of money. In 1984, 
uh, the house that my father and I were living in burned down. Like it burned to the ground. We were out of town. We each had a suitcase of clothes. And so he received a settlement from the house burning down. So that's $35,000 plus I don't even know how much he received. That was 84. In 86, he declared bankruptcy. He blew through thousands of dollars. Now listen, my dad is gone and he's with Jesus. And I'm just saying, I, I, I always try my best to honor him. But in this area of our lives, he would even tell you, like he even told me, I, like I did not handle money well. He did not handle money. And so these are during my formative years. This is how I'm learning to handle money. In 1986, um, my father uh, had this habit of betting football games on the weekend. I'm sure nobody here does that, but you probably know people. But anyway, he gambled. And at the age of four, 13, 14, 15, and 16, I used to call the bets into the bookie. I knew the bookie by name. And um, one weekend in 1986, we lost. I say we because I helped him handicap the football games. We lost $20,000 on one weekend of football. Well, here, here's the only problem with losing that much money. He didn't have it. So that was on a Sunday that we lost that money. On a Monday, we moved to California. We moved to California because I don't know if you know about bookies when they don't get their money, they, they get a little violent. And my dad feared for my safety, not necessarily his safety. He feared for my safety that they might do something to me. So we moved to California for about three months so I would be protected. We moved back from California after he made arrangements with the bookie. Y'all yeah, didn't know about this, did you? So we, we, we moved back from California. And um, my dad and I lived with some family members for a while until we finally got an apartment. And my dad didn't land a job, but he was making money. Say, so how was he making money? Well, it's a funny thing you ask. I found out about that. Um, one morning I was working at Hardy's and uh, I came home. I had a phone conversation with a girl I was trying to date, and she didn't date me. And as I look back now, that was a blessing from God. And I uh, went to bed. I woke up at about 11.30, and there was a man in my room with a gun. And he said, you need to get out of bed and come into the, come into the living room. My dad had been busted by the police for, for selling marijuana. And when that happened, listen to me, we lost it all. We were kicked out of our apartment, and during my senior year in high school, listen, I know what it's like to be homeless. I went from friend's house to friend's house to friend's house with nothing but a suitcase. That's where I was financially. My father and I finally were able to get together. We, we were able to scrape up some money and rent a trailer. And, and we did this thing where we went from trailer park to trailer park to trailer park until they would kick us out because we couldn't pay the rent anymore. So listen, let's not talk about where I am now. You need to understand where I came from. December 31st, 1989, I still remember where I was, and I still remember what I was doing. We had no food in our trailer. The wind chill that night got to six degrees above zero. I took $5 in my wallet. It's all I had. I went down to a place that had cheeseburger plates for $1.99. My dad and I bought a cheeseburger and french fries. I brought it back home, and we slept in our trailer that night, and our gas ran out, and my father and I nearly froze to death in our own home. So, when it comes to money and hard times, save your story. I've been broke, and I know what it's like. And it, listen, it sucks. It really does. But I made three decisions. Three decisions that changed the trajectory of my life when it comes to money. I just want to share them with you today, really quick. Number one, I finally put God first in my finances through tithing. I finally put God first in my finances through tithing. I don't know about you, but I love to be first. I love to win. I, I do not play games for fun. I do not, I, I, I want to win. I've, I'm a little bitter the other night. Karis, my four-year-old, and I were playing Candyland, the Disney Princess Edition, and she won. And I get, listen, it's jacked up because I was winning the whole game, and I hit that one ladder where you, I mean, I, I was mad, or no, it was shoots and ladders. That was it, it wasn't Candyland. I kicked her tail at candy. Anyway, so I, I, I love to win. I don't know about you, but I, I would be willing to bet that nobody in here goes, man, I love second place. I, love, I take all those second place. Like, if I'm about to win, I just back off because I love that second place trophy. The second place trophy is awesome. You know what the second place is? First person to lose. That's exactly what second place is. Nobody wants second place. You know what? God doesn't want second place. 
God's not interested in like your national rankings coming out every year and every week and him being ranked in the top five behind relationships and career and money and fame, you know. God, God wants to be number one. And the reason God wants to be number one is because God knows if we put anything in our lives in that number one slot, it's going to lead to disappointment. It's going to lead to frustration. It's going to lead to heartbreak. God knows he is the only one that can ultimately fulfill every single desire and more in our hearts. So God wants to be number one. And God wants to be, listen to me, number one in our finances. In our finances. And so, in 1990, I gave my life to Christ, but I did not surrender my finances to him until 1999. There was a nine-year battle over money. Oh, by the way, the whole nine years that I battled him, I was broke. I was broke. I was, I'm talking negative balance in the checkbook, broke. In the ministry, loving and serving Jesus and broke. That's where I was. Um, and so, so, so I finally realized that the Bible says things like in Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30, look at this. A tithe, now let me stop. A tithe, tithing is 10% off your gross income to the local church. That's what a tithe is. I've had people go, well, I'm, I don't tithe 10%, I tithe 5%. Well, then you don't tithe because tithe means 10. Tithing is 10% off the gross income to the local church. A tithe, and this is what the Bible says, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Now, in 20 years of ministry, I've received pushback, because, and I used to give pushback. And people say things like this, well, Perry, <laughs> this is the deal. That's the Old Testament. I'm kind of a New Testament guy. I mean, that's the Old Testament. That is the law, and I'm not under law anymore. Well, if that's your attitude, that's awesome. That just simply means that I should be able to drive your car home today and keep it. Well, you can't steal from me. Oh, whoa, whoa, thou shalt not steal is under the law. You're not an Old Testament person. Let's just not be Old Testament at all. In fact, if you make me mad about stealing your car, I can just kill you if I want. You can't kill me. Sure, I can't. It's under the law. I'm a grace guy, right? Listen, do you know that the Old Testament law and New Testament grace, that grace always takes it further than the law? Like in the Old Testament, it says, you shall not kill. In the New Testament, under grace, it said you shouldn't even have an angry heart, or an angry attitude in your heart towards someone. In the Old Testament, under law, it says do not commit adultery. In the New Testament, it says we shouldn't even have impure thoughts about the opposite sex. In the Old Testament, under the law, they had to bring a lamb once a year to satisfy the wrath of God. In the New Testament, under grace, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, actually came down here, hung on a cross, paid for your sin under your your sin and my. My sin, and because of him, we are able to be reconciled with God and have a right relationship with him. Grace always takes it further than the law did. So I, I pray, I just pray that you're not a person that uses grace as an excuse to give less and not more, because that just wouldn't be biblical at all. I have people say this, well, <laughs> here's the deal. I, I tithe in other ways. Excuse me? Well, I tithe in other ways. Unpack that for me. Well, we've literally had people say this. I deduct the gas money it takes me to drive to church to volunteer from my tithe. You, you, you do why? No, 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 I've heard that. I mean, we have people say, well, I, I, I don't tithe, but I volunteer extra. I don't tithe, but I read the Bible more. And you've heard me use this illustration before. That would be equivalent to breaking into somebody's house today and the cops show up and going, you're breaking in their house. Yeah, yeah, it's my officer. I broke no speed limits when I, on, on my way over here. You're breaking in the freaking house. I know, but I didn't break the speed limit. Well, you're still messing up. It would be equivalent to you messing around on your spouse and me coming to you going, you need to quit having an affair. Oh, oh okay, now I'm having the affair, but I'm spending extra time with my kids and I bought my wife the bedroom suit she wanted. Like, that's dumb. But we'll say, listen, let me explain this. We want, as Christians, many times, we will be disobedient in one area of our lives, and, and we will not yield that area of our lives to Christ, but we'll be, we, we, instead of being obedient in that area, we'll go over here, I'm going to read my Bible more, I'm going to pray more, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve more, I'm going to do whatever. Listen to me, if you don't get anything else I say today, get this. Disobedient or radical obedience in another area of our life does not excuse disobedience in one area of our life. 
Radical obedience in other areas of our lives never covers up the disobedience that God is trying to deal with in our lives. God, listen, Jesus died on the cross to impact our entire lives. And I've had people say this, well, Perry, I can't afford to tithe. Let me tell you this. If you, that, that's like saying we're going to have children when we're ready for children. Parents, were you ready for the kids? Heck no. You're not ready for kids. If you're going to wait till you're ready for kids, here's what I know about you. You're never having kids. They show, listen, they show up. Oh, my dang, they show up selfish. I'm talking, you're not ready. You just, you just go for it, right? You just figure it out on the fly. I have realized in the past four years how stupid I am as a father, and it's a miracle that my daughter is actually alive. You don't wait till you're ready. You just go for it. It's the same thing. If you're going to wait till you're ready to tithe, guess what I know about you? You're never going to tithe. It's called a step of faith for a reason. It's called a step of faith for a reason. And by the way, the people that say that's under the law, it's not actually under the law. It was before the law. God established tithing in Genesis 14 when Abraham tithed the Melchizedek 500 years before the law. And then 400 years before the law in Genesis 28, we see tithing actually take place again. God said this in Malachi chapter 3, verses 6 through 11. And I love it when people go, well, you know, tithing's Old Testament and God's changed his mind. I love how God starts out this passage. Verse 6 of Malachi 3, I, the Lord, do not change. God's changed his mind. I, the Lord, do not <clears throat> change. I'm just reading the Bible. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. In other words, God says, if you'll come back to me, I'll come back to you. I know a lot of people go, I'm waiting on God. No, 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 no. In this area of our lives, God's waiting on us. God said, if you will return to me, I will return to you. Return to me and I'll return to you. But, how, but you ask, how are, we to, how are we to return? Verse 8. Man, this is where like the fertilizer hits the fan right here. Verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. Now everybody's in here, I would not, rob, I would not roll up on God with, with, with a gun and go, give me your money. No, 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 no. We do something far worse. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. God said, if you're not tithing, you're robbing me. Well, God, I'm reading my Bible more. And we need to talk about that robbery. Then he says this in verse 9. This is the scariest part. You're under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you're robbing me. I want, you, I want to stop. If you're not tithing... Here's the bad news. Your finances are cursed. They're, they're cursed. And here's what I've discovered personally. God can do more with 90% that are blessed than you can do with 100% that's cursed. In other words, I said this, and you can tweet this, by the way. If he's not first, it's cursed. I don't care what area of your life it's in. If he's not first in your marriage, you have a cursed marriage. If he's not first in your life, you have a cursed life. And if he's not first in your finances, your finances are cursed. But the curse can be broken. How can the curse be broken? The Bible says this in verse 10. Bring the whole tithe. Bring the whole tithe. God said bring it because it's his. Like if you borrow my lawnmower today... If I call you, I don't even have a lawnmower. That's a bad... If you borrow my car today, I'm not going to call you next week and go, would you please give me my car? I'm not going to ask you to give me my car because it's mine. I'm going to be like, bring my car home. That's why God said bring the tithe because it's his. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Let me stop. That's the local church. I've had people say, well, here's the deal, Perry. I mean, I could never give 10% of my income to the local church, and so I give 2% here and 3% here. And da, da, da. Listen, that's great. That's awesome. The Bible says 10% of the local church. Bible says Bible says 10% of the local church. You, we got to understand, oh, well, the church must need financial support. The church does not need financial support. You need to be blessed. And the church is the only place in the scriptures that God said we could bring the tithe. He didn't say we could tithe to this organization and our colleges and our... You know, listen, give to those other things, that's fine. I'm telling you, in the Bible, and if you want to argue with me on this... Bring your Bible and your big boy pants. Because God said there is not one single example in the scriptures of anyone ever bringing less than 10% to the house of God, Old Testament or New Testament. 
God has called us to give to the church because, listen to me, the church is the hope of the world. I will guarantee you that every organization you're giving to other than the church will not exist in 200 years. But if Jesus tarries for 200 more years, the church will still be here, and she still will be going strong, and she still will be beautiful, and she still will be winning people for Christ. There's not a better investment on the planet than the local church. Bring the whole tithe in the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And then he says, this, test me in this. I love this. This is awesome. When two knights back in, the old, you know, back in the old times, when they used to be getting ready to fight, one would take his glove off if they were getting ready to fight, and he would throw his glove down. That was literally called throwing down the gauntlet. And when you threw down the gauntlet, you were like, let's do this. Let's get this on right now, me and you. That's what God is doing in this verse right here. He's throwing down the gauntlet. He's like, Let, let's do this, me and you. Test me. Test me. It's the only place in the Bible that God ever says, test me. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. By the way, he identified himself there. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing <laughs> that you will not have room enough for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Listen, either that verse is true or it's not. Either it's true or it's not. You know what God just said? You can't outgive me. You give me with a spoon, I'll pour it back in your life with a shovel. Jesus talked about tithing. He said this in Matthew 23, 23. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens. But you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. Look at this. You should tithe. Yes. I want to stop right there. That's the only verse in tithing on the Bible I do it. Jesus Christ, the one who paid for my sins on a cross, said I should tithe. How in the world do we bellyache in the shadow of a bloodstained cross about the 10% that he allowed us to make in the first place? I don't get that. I don't get that. Now, let me tell you, I didn't do it. For nine years, I didn't do it. I was like, well, I'm in the ministry. I don't have to tithe. And I give God the other way. And I went there that time, and they didn't pay me to speak. And da 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 And all these things. Until 1999, I finally, finally, finally surrender my finances to God. Now, let me tell you where I was when I surrendered my finances to God. Broke. I couldn't afford to tithe. I literally had $200 in my checking account. I had just resigned my job to start this church. And I had been praying about it. I've been reading the scriptures. And I decided, you know what? I got to do this. I've got to put God first. I surrender my finances to God on the day that I said I would start this church is the day I surrender my finances to the Lord. I mean, it's easy to trust God when you're broke because you ain't got nothing. I'll give you everything. And God's like, you don't have anything. Anyway, so I gave him $200. Now, here's what's crazy. This was like toward the middle of the month. At the end of the month, I had like $950. It was going to take $950 to pay my bills. But I'd resigned, so I had no money coming in. I was broke. The next day, I know this sounds like a preacher story, and it is, but it's true. The next day, a guy came by the church where I was serving. He's like, I know you're broke. I know you're starting this church. I, I just felt the Lord tell me to write you this check and give you this check. And he gave me the check, and the check was $750. I now had $950 to pay my bills. Yay, God! And I was celebrating, giving God the fist bump and the chest bump and the high five. And God spoke to me and said, you need a tithe. I was like, well, I, <clears throat> I was going to do that next month. But see, God, here's the deal. I need $950. This is so cool. Look at this. I've got my piece of paper. I've got it all figured out. God, this is $950. I need $950. And if I, if I write a $75 check, then I'm going to have $875, not $950. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come a little short, God. So um, we can do that tithing. I know what I said yesterday, but I was, I was desperate yesterday. I'm not as desperate today. I got a $750 check. So we can just kind of work this out. And the whole conversation, God spoke to me and said, now. I don't know if your hand has ever shook when you wrote a check. The scariest check I've ever written in my life was that day for $75. $75. $75. Now, I'd written some of those, and the police always brought them back, but $75. $75. Surrender my finances. Oh, 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 by the way, about a week and a half later, I got another $1,000 completely unexpected from somewhere. I didn't even know where it was coming from. And about two weeks after that, somebody in the core group said, 
you know what? I believe God sent us here to pay your salary for the first three months so you don't have to get a job so you can focus on nothing but the church. I'm telling you, it broke the curse in my life. And it will yours as well. You just got to have the faith to go for it. You got to have faith to go for it. Number two, I made a commitment to get out of debt. I made a commitment to get out of debt. Now, I would ask people who's in debt here, but like some people wouldn't raise their hand because we don't want people to know, but most of us are probably in debt. I lived there for years. You know how I got in debt? I call it the minimum payment lifestyle. Do you know in America you can finance anything? 90 days, same as cash, which is not, 90 days is not the same as cash. But I, I, listen, listen, let me tell you how screwed up I was financially. One day I went in the mail and I got this letter in the mail that told me, it said pre-approved. You ever got one of those? Pre-approved for a credit card. These people loved me. It was a master card for $2,000 credit line. And I, I did what all of us do. I, I, I got the credit card. I pulled it out. I put it in my pocket. I said, I'm going to use it in case of, you did it too, didn't you? Isn't it amazing what qualifies as an emergency when you have a credit card in your pocket? Seriously, how many of you have ever made a bad financial decision? Raise your hand. Come on, be honest, be honest. How many of you drove your bad financial decision to church today? Okay, a few of you living in your financial decision, married to your bad financial... No, 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 don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. I've got it on sale. Anyway, so, so we've all... You have saved more money buying things on sale. Anyway, we, we, we have all made bad financial decisions. Let me tell you about mine. I maxed out that credit card, and it started by me riding down the road thinking about my emergency. I was like, I am a man in the South, and I don't own a handgun. That's an emergency. <laughs> I mean, men in the South ought to own a handgun, right? Have one for every room and one for every vehicle, so I'll, I've got to start somewhere. Some of you are like, Pastor, I believe in gun control. I do too. I have a gun. I will control you if you come in my house. That's, I mean, that's gun control. <laughs> so I was like, I need a gun. So I went and bought a Smith & Wesson 9mm. And the next month, I got the bill in the mail. Listen, it was $350, but the minimum payment was $13. I was like, these people love me. Didn't do the math and add it up and figure out that I would pay the gun off by the time my grandchildren got out of college. I just... I just assumed they loved me. I went shopping. I maxed out that credit card. I maxed out that credit card and six others like it with more money. And then I went to some finance companies. And then I helped a friend of mine out that had gotten in debt to the check cashing places. By the way, if you're here from a check cashing place, you, you, you listen, you just need to get out of that. I'm helping people. Listen, you're the, yeah, you're about like if I was drowning and you would hand me a cement block. See, period, it's tense in here. I know it's tense. You know why? Let me tell you what the, you're doing. You're robbing people. You need to knock it off. I've seen your fees. It's ridiculous. I added it up, and when Lucretia and I got married, we had around $115,000 worth of debt. Didn't even own a home. It was great. You want to talk about starting a marriage all stressful? We weren't stressed. We just didn't argue over money because you don't argue over things you don't have. <laughs> you know when I realized it was really bad is when we went to buy furniture. We went to buy furniture when we were getting married. We needed a bedroom suit because I had a bed, but somebody had given it to me, and it came over on the Mayflower with the pilgrims, and it was like one of those things right there. And I, I, it took you 10 minutes to get out of the bed. You know the bed you got from your great-grandparents or something. So I had this bed, and I was like, we can't sleep in this bed. So I, I went, we went over to, to Rooms Have Gone, and, and we went over to kind of select a bedroom suit, and we got the bedroom suit selected and everything. And the person at Rooms Have Gone that came out and told me, they said, your credit has been denied. Do you know how embarrassing it is to get told in front of your finance, 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 that's exactly what she financed me, <laughs> fiance, that you're broke? So we left there and we went to another place. I am hooking on phonics this morning. We went to another place. They told me that I was turned down for credit too. And I discovered something. I discovered what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7 is true. The rich rule over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. You know what? Credit card companies were my owner. They owned me. I wasn't working for Jesus. I was working for them. And I've been to those places. They have really nice buildings. 
And every time I drive by, I'd be like, I'm paying for that. And so you know what happened? Lucretia and I met this guy named Dave Ramsey in 2002. And I realized something. You can't give God 10% and be stupid with the other 90%. Now, before you're, did you call me stupid? No, no, I called me stupid, okay? I was stupid. You're probably the smartest person on the world. I'm, I'm telling you, I was stupid with money. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 20, in the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all he has. I devoured all I had and went and financed more. $115,000 in debt and didn't even own a home. And Lucretia and I made the commitment in 2002, we're getting out of debt. We are getting out of debt. And listen, we made the decision and we followed through. It's not like the person that said, I'm losing weight and by 12 o'clock they're eating Twinkies, okay? That, that, that's, we, we didn't go there. We said, I, we're making a decision and we're following through and we set up a budget and we did debt snowball and we, like, we were serious about getting out of debt. And we, we wrote it all out and put it all down. We had a five-year plan to get out of debt. We're going to be, we're going to be debt-free in 2007. We didn't, we didn't make it. We didn't get debt-free in 2007. We got debt-free in 2005 and then went to celebrate for our five-year anniversary, went to Hawaii for vacation, paid cash for the whole thing, and flew first class. I'm telling you, somebody, it must be nice. It was freaking awesome. I hope you can do it sometime. <laughs> People have asked me before, you, you travel some. It must be nice. Hey, listen, I ain't got no bills. I don't owe anybody. I'm not in. The only thing I owe on is my home. That's it. I don't owe anybody anything. And somebody goes, you must be lucky. Listen to me. I want you to, I want you to listen to me. I want you to, I'm going to say exactly what I mean. I'm going to mean exactly what I say. When you say you're lucky, here's what I would say to you. To hell with your luck. To hell with your luck. I don't need your luck. See, I have a sovereign God that reigns in this universe and rules over my life. He is sovereign. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He can do anything he wants, anytime he wants. He is not controlled by leprechauns or four-leaf clovers or black cats or breaking mirrors. To hell with your luck because that's exactly where the concept of luck came from. Hell. It can go back there because I have a sovereign God. I don't believe in luck. If, by the way, if luck is your plan to get out of debt, you're, you're stuck. I'm going to win the lottery. No, you're not. <laughs> the Bible says this in Proverbs 21.5, the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. You want to get out of debt? Listen to me. You can. Because here's what I know. I want you to listen to me, everybody. If you're in debt and in financial bondage, you didn't get there because you followed Jesus there. But you can follow him out. He will bring you out of that, and it's not going to be luck. It's going to be surrender and sweat that brings you there. But you can do this because Captain Stupid did it. And if I can come out of it, you can come out of it too. Number three, and I'll close with this, I chose generosity over greed. I am not a generous person by nature, and neither are you. Neither are your children. What's, the first, what's one of the first words your kids learns? Mine, mine, that, that, that we, we've got that concept down, don't we? And let me tell you, when, when it comes to food, that's me. I'm not a food sharer. I think food shares ought to be drawn and quartered. I, I do not understand why people, like people go, oh, you want to try some of that? No, I don't want to try that. If I want to try that, I'd order that. Let me have some of yours. No, I'll buy you one. Can I have four French fries? No, I'll buy you a bag of French fries, okay? I will cover you up in French fries, but these are my French fries. I know I'm, I, I've got problems. I was, at, I was at dinner one time and I ordered a dessert and a lady at the table that I didn't even know went, oh, I've been wanting to try that. <laughs> well, I suggest you order one, ma'am. <laughs> Lucretia and I, some of our biggest fights, she's not in the service so I can talk about this. Some of our biggest fights is when we have shared the baked apple dumpling at Cracker Barrel and it got to the point where I had to take something to draw a thing right down the middle and then she would steal all the ice cream. We had ice cream fights, right? And I believe like, you stole the ice cream. So now we get two scoops. Or no, three scoops. It comes with two scoops. We get three scoops. And I'm, t I'm telling you, I, I, I'm naturally greedy, and so are you. We're naturally, now we don't call it greedy. We call it careful. But have you seen that show, Hoarders? Oh, my dang. 
some gross people in this world. But that's what we are. We're, we're, but, but no, 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 I'm being careful, Pastor Pete. Uh-uh, uh-uh, we're being greedy. Do you know my life has been marked by generous people? Several examples. When I first started going to church, I went to Brushy Creek Baptist Church in Easley, South Carolina. It's where I met Christ. It's where I surrendered to ministry. God used that church in significant ways to impact my life. But when I first started going, I was, I was so poor, I was still living in that trailer that we had lost our heat in. And I had, I had a pair of jeans that had holes in them, and that's back when you didn't pay for holes. You just kind of, you just, I mean, that didn't pay extra for them at least. I had a couple of shirts that I looked back, listen, they were just ratty. I looked, I looked like a hobo. I mean, I just had clothes that people had given me. I didn't have, listen, I did not have nice clothes. So one day the preacher asked me, Preacher Gray, he said, can I see you after the service today? I always, that always freaks me out when somebody says, can I see you later? Because I'll think about it until later. I'm that person. Like, you want to screw me up? Talk, call me today and say, I need to meet with you at 9 o'clock in the morning. Click. <gasps> so I, 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 the whole service, I'm just all freaked out. You know what I'm saying? And I got back there in his office and I sat down. And he looked at me across his desk and he said, son, you don't have any church clothes, do you? Now, I just got to be honest with you. My heart dropped. And it wasn't because I was embarrassed because I didn't have church clothes. It was because I was like, here's where they tell me not to come back. Here's where they tell me I can't come to this church anymore. Here's where they tell me I'm not qualified. Here's where they walk me out the door. But he didn't say that. And never will forget Preacher Gray looking at me from across that desk. And he said, I need you here in this parking lot, 5 o'clock on Saturday. I'm taking you shopping. We're going to buy you some clothes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. So 5 o'clock Saturday, I showed up. There was Preacher Gray. Now, I figured we were going to go down to, like, the Goodwill store, and he's going to buy me a couple of $2 shirts or whatever. Uh-uh. He took me to Belk. He bought me a jacket, a, a sports jacket, two pair of dress pants, a pair of dockers, two dress shirts, two ties. I never will forget it. I cried because they were so generous to me. I never ever will forget that church. So I wore my suit the next Sunday. I looked good. I rolled up in the church. People were like, oh, you look good. I was like, dang straight. <laughs> he walked up to me before the service. He said, I need to see you. I went to the evening service. He said, I need to see you immediately after the service. I was like, crap. So I didn't listen to the <laughs> message or anything he preached on. I walked back to his office. and He said, by the way, I need you to know that a men's Sunday school class took up the money to buy you that suit. And so my wife's Sunday school class found out they did that, so they took up an offering too. And he handed me an envelope with cash in it. And listen, I was in college, I was broke, I didn't have any money. He said, they wanted you to go buy underwear and socks. <laughs> I opened it up, it was like $100. I haven't ran out of underwear since that day. I mean, I, it's because <laughs> men wear underwear until they dissolve. We don't ever buy new ones. I'll never forget that. Listen, 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 listen. I went to my, after that, I went to my next church, and I was actually on staff there. I wore that, I wore that sports jacket, and every week I wore it. I just, because that's all I had. That's all I had. So the pastor one day, true story, he said, I need to see you at the church today. <laughs> I walked in his office, and I sat down, and he looked at me, and he said, I need to ask you a question. Are those the only church clothes you got? Yep. He said, me and the deacons were talking about that. I need you to meet Mark here. Mark was a deacon in the church. He said, I need you to meet Mark here next Saturday. We're going to take you to Greenville to SNK. We're going to buy you two brand new suits. I've never forgotten that. People who follow Jesus are more generous, not more greedy. If you're following Jesus, you're becoming more generous. You're not trying to hoard stuff so much so that it's happening in this church i found out a story but we got a home group in this church we got a home group in this church that in fact they, they're at the anderson campus and after um i believe it's the first service they go out to eat every week at the same restaurant they've gotten to know one of the waitresses they've gotten to know her story their story broke their heart this is a true story this happened like last week in the past week or two they got to know her story. The, her story is her, her kids keep making some bad decisions. They go to jail. Guess who gets their kids? Grandma. And she's working hard, and she's trying to make ends meet. And right in the middle of this whole thing, her car broke down. Her car broke down. You know what a home group at our church did? 
They didn't pick up the phone and go, there's this waitress we know, and y'all, I give tithe money to the church, and y'all need to run down there and buy her car. Click. Uh-uh. This home group got together, pulled their money together, bought her a car, got it fixed up, and gave it to her last week, and she doesn't even go to our church. Man, is that not awesome? Now, I'm sure every campus did. You'll clap for that, but will you do it? But will you do it? See, generosity is not I've identified a need and I tell somebody that I think that can meet it. Generosity is not I see a need, I'm going to take it out of my tithe money. Generosity is I'm going to see a need and I'm going to meet a need. And you know what? Being generous is fun. So much so, and listen, if you're listening on podcast or you're watching online, I know I might get some heat for this, but I need you to understand something. I am talking to my church right now. One of the beauties of podcasting is we can go all over the world, but people go, you said this, and and they don't understand. I'm not preaching to an international audience right now. My focus is New Spring Church. I love New Spring Church, and this is nothing more right now than a pastor talking to his church. But I'm, I'm smoking what I'm selling when it comes to this generosity stuff. Back in 2007, when we made a capital campaign, we made the decision to, to, to um, Lucretia and I made the decision to give a certain amount of money. And then we said over and above that, I'm going to make this, I made the decision that from 2007 to 2010, every dime of outside speaking money that I got, every dime, I signed the check and I handed it to the church. That's all I did. I signed the check and I handed it to the church. I signed the check and I handed it to the church. And when the whole thing was over in three years, Lucretia and I were able to give over $100,000 to this church. You know why? It's fun. It's awesome. And people go, well, $100,000. Well, what about Karis' college? I have a heavenly father that loves my daughter more than I do. And you know what I saw in the scripture? I saw this in Psalm 37. I saw this in Psalm 37, verse 25 and 26. I was young, and now I am old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. Well, who are the righteous? Well, it says in the next verse, they are always generous and lend freely. Their children will be blessed. My little girl is going to be blessed because I'm modeling for her tithing, financial stewardship, and generosity. And God will bless her because of it. And he'll bless your kids too. Paul wrote Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, command those who are rich. I want to stop because somebody goes, well, he's not talking to me. Let me tell you something. Listen to me. Everybody on every campus. I'm rich. I'm so rich. It blows my mind how rich I am. Some of you are like, I'm not rich. Well, I'm sure you're not, but let me just tell you how rich I am, and then we'll see if we have anything in common. My car stayed inside last night. This little garage that's bigger than most houses. So is yours, by the way all over the world. If your car stayed inside, you're rich. I'm so rich that I got up this morning and it was cold in my house and all I had to do was go over and push a little button and my house began to heat up. That's how rich I am. I I don't know if you've got that in your house, but if you've got it, you're, you're rich. I'm so rich that I went to get some food this morning and I opened my pantry door and I had multiple options of food that I wanted. I'm so rich that if I want to, I could leave this place today and go out and pay someone to bring me a meal. And if they don't bring it in the right amount of time, I can scream about it the whole time because I'm that rich. I'm so rich that I got in my closet this morning and I had multiple outfits to choose from. I'm that rich and so are you. We are way more blessed than we think we are. We are rich. Do you know if you make $33,000 or above, you're in the top 1% of wage earners in the world? In the world. Because over 50% of the world lives on $2 a day. But because we're Americans, well, we're poor. America, where they have obesity medicine and depression medicine for dogs. For dogs. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, a.k.a. 401k, stock market, Wall Street. But, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. I've had people say, well, you know, Perry, having a lot of money is a sin. Uh-uh. Having a lot of money is not a sin. Money having you is a sin. 
The Bible says God provides us with everything for our enjoyment. If, listen, if you're poverty theology, poverty theology has done as much damage, if not more, than prosperity theology in our country. I'm not the kind of guy that has to live in a cave and come out on triple coupon Thursdays because that's the only thing I can afford. God has blessed me. God has blessed many of you. The question is, is there anything in your life that you tell him, no, you can't, you can't have this, God. That's when it becomes an idol. That's when it becomes a problem. He said, command them to do good. So right now, the Bible says, command the church to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Why? Verse 19, in this way they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So when you walked in today, you got one of these. All of our campuses, you got one of these folders. It was already tense because some of y'all, you started, you started like browsing through. You're like, oh, crap, they're talking about giving today. I brought a friend. <sighs> Glad you brought a friend. Your friend needed to hear this message. But it, it, it's, it's, it's a, it, and by the way, we got some amazing volunteers that, that, that stuff these things. It took like hundreds of hours. They told me, they said, if God changes your message, we might kill you. <laughs> I said, I tell you what, if God changes my message, I'll send him to your house too, all right? Um, in this first pocket right here, I'm going to ask you to make three commitments today. Number one, I'm going to ask you to make the commitment to tithe. Some of you are like, how long? For, for the rest of your life. Why would I ask you to? I'm, going to, I'm, I'm never going to be the pastor that says, I want you to know, be obedient for about three more weeks and then you can be disobedient. Listen, listen, I know it's hard because I've been there. I know it's hard because I've been there there but either the word of god is true or it's not and if the word of god is true that you can't outgive him second thing i'm going to ask you to do is make a commitment that, oh by the way in this right here this right here this first folder it says giving options at new spring church and it's how to how to sign up for online giving we've got most of our church moving toward online giving anyway i've had people say is that a sin to give online no well jesus didn't do it he didn't have air conditioner either all right god gosh anyway it's amazing. Um, second one is, is the second commitment I'm going to ask you to make is to get out of debt. Now, now, right here, this little thing, the rich rule over the poor and borrow a servant and lender. If you'll notice, um, you can put your you can put your debit card or your credit card in that and just carry it around. And every time you're getting ready to make a purchase, you can be like, "Oh, there's a Bible verse." <laughs> Isn't that cute? There's all kinds of budget information here, financial. Listen, you want to do a budget, it's right here. There are websites, there are resources. But listen to me, I don't want a thing from you. I want you to listen to me, every church, every campus. I don't want a thing from you. I want something for you. So if you think that the church is after your money when it comes to tithing, do this. Go home, get out the yellow pages, open them up, do your finger like this, throw it down. Wherever your finger hits, tithe to that church for the next three or four months and see if God doesn't bless you. I don't... I, it's not about me, and it's not about this church getting your money. It's about you getting the curse off your life. And this right here, listen, if you'll go to newspring.cc, you'll find a financial resources page. On that resources page, there are sermons, there are budget forms, and if you need financial coaching, if you need somebody to sit down with you. Now, with married couples, we only do this if both people come. And by the way, it's usually the man that refuses to come because he's full of pride. It's usually the man, by the way, that says, we can't afford to tithe. And that's, that's, sir, that's a big truck you're driving. So anyway, I'm just shouting, listen. Around, I think, 60 to 70% of marriages fail today because of financial problems. If we could just get couples out of debt, if that could, if that could solve 60 to 70% of your problems, then is it a gospel thing? Absolutely. If we can help you, you, listen, you can sign up for coaching online today, and we have people that will sit down and meet with you and help you develop a plan to get out of debt. And the third thing I'm asking you to do is be generous. In this third folder, it says be generous. There's a list of things that, um, that, that our church does. And listen, listen, this is the reason I would challenge you to do that. It's because we got a Christmas offering coming up. And at the bottom of this sheet right here, is a Christmas offering envelope that you can go ahead and begin to pray through what you're going to give at the Christmas offering. This church, let me tell you something. This church is unbelievably generous. You're here today because somebody's been generous for the past 11 years. Somebody didn't hold back. Last year, I asked the church to step up big and give because we were starting a campus. This year, we're starting three. By the way, we've already got the contract signed for the Spartanburg campus. They're going to be having services um, in, starting in Easter at the downtown uh, uh, Marriott. 
the, the Renaissance Marriott, downtown Spartanburg. Um, Greenwood and Myrtle Beach are, are getting really, really close to signing a couple places. I'm telling you, we're starting three campuses next year. We're going to give away shoes away in December like we did last year. We gave shoes away to over 1,600 kids. This year, we're hoping to go over 2,000. We're seeing God do some amazing things. But you know how much ministry you can do for $100? About $100 worth. So I'm asking this church one more time, like you've always done for the Christmas offering, to step up and give big. You say, Perry, why would you preach an entire message on giving? Well, I had a friend teach me something in the scriptures. He said, he said the noun in the Bible, the subject of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, the noun, the subject in the Bible is, you want to help me? Jesus, right? The, we're in church. The answer is Jesus. If, if, if I lead you like that, the answer is always Jesus. It's always Jesus. But he said, if Jesus is the noun, he asked me this question, what's the verb? I said, beg your pardon? He said, what's the verb? I'm like you. So I heard somebody over here say Jesus. I said, I said, I said Jesus, because the answer is always Jesus. He said, nope. If the noun is Jesus, the verb is give. We're here today because God gave. If you're a Christian, you're a Christian because God gave. In fact, the most popular verse in all the Bible, John 3, 16, says, For God so loved the world that he gave. You can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. God, loved the world. God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whoever, listen to me, every church, every campus, every person, whoever, whoever means you, believes in him, will not perish, but will have eternal life. I was on my way to church this morning. I told my little girl on the way here, I was like, Karis, do you understand every good thing we have in life comes because God gave? My wife, my child, this church, my friends, everything good in my life is the result of God giving. And so there are people here today, you need to surrender your finances to the Lord. Those three, listen, at the end of the day, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Those three things changed my life. But there are other people here on every one of our campuses. You need to give your life to Christ. Because maybe today you understood for the first time, God sent his son and Jesus gave his life on a cross to pay for our sins so we could be made right with God. Until we say, Jesus, I want you into my life. I confess you as my Lord. I want to follow you for the rest of my life. Then we're under a curse, not just financial, but an eternal one. But the day we surrender our life to Christ, our soul is power washed and we're made brand new. So I'm going to challenge you to do that with heads bowed and eyes closed. All over our campus, every campus today, there are people here. If you need to give your life to Christ, if you need to give your life to Jesus today, I want to invite you to do that. You say, that's a message on giving. We've had people give their life to Jesus all day in a message on giving. And then, listen, listen, I'm just going to say this. There's a lot of people getting up and moving. Stop. If it's an emergency, leave. But right now, there are people that need to make life and death decisions. And on every campus, you could be distracting them. I'm asking you, that, I'm telling you, there's nothing more important than people giving their lives to Christ right now. There are people here today, right now, you need to give your life to Jesus. So if that's you, with heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want you to ask him. The Bible says if we confess him as Lord, and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. So if you need to do that right now, I want to invite you to pray with me and just say, Jesus Christ, I need you in my life. I confess you right now, Jesus, as my Lord, my God, and my King. Jesus Christ, I'm a sinner, and I need you. I confess that I need you and ask you to take over. I surrender everything to you, Jesus. Show me how to follow you the rest of my life, the best I know how. In your name I pray. With heads bowed and eyes closed, everybody here, listen, all heads bowed, all eyes closed, every campus, if you just pray to receive Christ, would you do me a favor? Would you do me a favor? Just real big. All I want you to do is raise your hand and say, man, I just nailed it down, Pastor Pete. I just nailed it down. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Other campuses, you raise your hand right now. If you pray to receive Christ, you just raise your hand. Any campus, Columbia, Greenville, Florence, Charleston, East or West Auditorium, we had hands go up. We've had hands go up every service today of people giving their lives to Jesus. Preach a message on tithing and people give their lives to Jesus. 
If you raised your hand, listen, all I want you to do before the end of the day today is either number one, send us an email at hello at newspring.cc and let us know you prayed to receive Christ. Or number two, stop by guest services today and say, hey, I prayed to receive Christ. What do I need to do now? Because we'd love to give you a Bible and a gift and help you take your next step in following him. Thank you, Jesus. You are the God that gave it all. And God, I pray that today, today at New Spring Church, there would be people that surrender to you through tithing, that surrender to you by God God actually getting on a budget and getting out of debt and experiencing the freedom that you so want us to have. And God, I pray there would be people that step up and are generous to the people around them and continue to be generous to this church. We are where we are today because you have led people throughout the past 11 years to be generous. We love you, Jesus, and thank you that you are a God who is generous. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. I love you. God bless. I'll see you next week.